Uh, this is my contribution to this book. <clears throat> it's about a boy and a girl. SpiceJet Airlines, flight 0S295, two hours nonstop on a near empty 737 from Delhi to Mumbai. I spent most of our time in the air looking out the window. The lack of announcement from the cockpit suggested the pilot had opted for a nap. <laughs> but quietly proving herself smarter than either of us, the beautiful woman back in seat 23D with the long black hair and the light brown skin instead spent the whole trip hiding behind a copy of National Geographic. Now, a smoother, more confident version of me might have asked her what she was reading or subtly mentioned the thousands upon thousands of miles I had put myself between myself and my terrible apartment in Wicker Park, or <laughs> made a casual reference to how I, at the wise old age of 26, was about to abandon a very promising career in software engineering for a more theoretically glamorous life of writing, not, not unlike a young Ernest Hemingway, really, but <laughs> training the post-war Paris cafes for the seedier bars in half-developed cities of India. I, however, was not smooth, nor was I confident, nor did I have any real idea of how to talk to intriguing women aboard domestic flights in foreign countries, reducing our interaction to an awkward wave of my right hand as we landed, as though to say, you can go first, <laughs> but hoping she would interpret that as, you have very pretty green eyes. <laughs> she smiled, stepped past me and off of the plane and disappeared into the shuffle of Shivaji International Airport, a beautiful ghost passing through on her way to someplace else. But when I saw her later that afternoon in, the, in a Mumbai marketplace, now she was someone. She was the girl from Flight 0S295, which meant I was the guy from Flight 0S295, <laughs> which meant I had contacts, which meant I had some stupid excuse for talking to this woman, which was to say I was so in. <laughs> I, I need your help, I said, trying not to move as I spoke to her, lest I drown in the sweat of the brutal Indian heat. I don't know what to buy for my sister back home. <laughs> oh, is that so? She teased, her voice carrying just a hint of a British accent. You couldn't ask me about that on the plane? <laughs> <laughs> you were on my flight? <laughs> what are the odds? I can admit now, uh, surprise was not all that convincing. <laughs> this might be a surprise, she said, almost laughing at me now, but Buzz-cut white people tend to stick out in this case. <laughs> but my name is Jaya, she continued, from my Indian grandmother. And the crowd bustled behind us, barefoot old women selling fresh fruit and young men hawking some extremely convincing designer knockoffs. And from my British father, a useful cheapness with money, she joked. So come on, I'll teach you how to shop in this place. And she took my hand, her fingers wrapped lightly around mine, just enough to guide, though not enough to hold. And we walked through the marketplace in search of bargains on throw pillows and jewelry. And between buying bracelets and haggling for shirts I only guessed my sister would wear, I asked her about the camera she was carrying. Freelance, she explained. Magazines, postcards, whatever comes up. So for you, this might be vacation. But for me, this week is also a job. I told her about my big plan to become a writer when I got back home. Oh, well, then I'm going to show you how to take pictures. You won't get any good jobs if all you can do is scribble some words. <laughs> she had a point. Here, she said, handing me her camera. Capture something beautiful. I leaned back, pointing the lens right back at her. Cute, she said, but you didn't let it focus. Look at this, this is terrible. My hair's blowing all over the place. You can't even tell this is a person. She took hold of the camera, turning some dials and pressing some buttons before handing it back to me. Don't think about what's in the shot, she said. Just think about what you see. Come on, I'll show you. 
We walked together through the city, taking turns shooting the opulent wealth and abhorrent squalor all sitting side by side. Centuries of blatant class warfare had formed two cities at once, but rather than separate them by roads and rivers, the people of Mumbai had simply built on top of each other, miles upon miles of slums collapsing at the doorsteps of billionaires' estates. Take a picture of that, she said, pointing to one miniature palace in particular. And trying my best to impress her, I turned the lens to catch the sun's rays bursting over the top of the marble and wrought iron fence protecting it from would-be invaders. Not bad, she said before fiddling with the knobs, stepping back and ducking down on one knee before shooting, but, but there's more over there than just the house. And she turned the LCD screen so I could see it. The house, yes, but in hers, that marble and wrought iron fence I had focused upon ran towards the lower left corner of the frame and trailed off into the horizon. The estate rising up like some luxurious volcano in this sea of filth, garbage lining the dirt sidewalks as a man lay in the street, right leg missing, skin badly flaking. The man who lives there is a friend of our family from my father's days working for the embassy, she explained. And we came here often when I was a child, which my mother loved because she could see her family, even though some of them never forgave her for running off with Agora. What's Agora? I asked. She paused before saying, it's a Hindi word, and pointing at my arm. White man. Well, what would they think of you being out in the town with a, with a Gora like me? My older relatives would probably be upset, and my younger relatives probably wouldn't care, she said. But I don't tell my family everything. And I thought about everyone I knew back home, about who would be happy I had met this intelligent, headstrong woman, and who would be angry that she had brown skin. And perhaps she and I had more in common than I realized. But moments became hours, and hours became days, and. My vacation quietly became our vacation. She acting as tour guide, cultural ambassador, and co-conspirator all at once. Each day we would dine in a different cafe, giving a new story to the revolving cast of waiters and bartenders. We're here on business. No, thanks, we're on our honeymoon, actually. Actually, you know, we're shooting a, a Bollywood remake of Star Wars, <laughs> where I play Han Solo, and she plays Princess Leia. <laughs> One afternoon, we walked along the water to the gateway of India, that archway facing out onto the city's eastern harbor. And she pointed out a group of three young Indian men loitering along the fence around the monument, all scowling in my direction. They don't like us, she said. No, I think they just don't like me, I said. I think they think I've stolen something. Stupid, I scolded myself. What, what's the matter with you? That's a person, that's not something. Damn it, Riley. But, but look over there, I joked, trying to sound all cool, pointing towards a 30-ish looking white man standing by himself, his Christos polo shirt and Queensland rugby baseball cap giving him away as Australian. That guy loves me. Taking my gesture as some kind of invitation, the Australian walked over to us, tipping his hat to her before stopping in front of me. I just want to tell you, he said, his gaze alternating, alternating between my eyes and her shirt. <laughs> that it's nice to know I'm not the only one here who's into these brownies. <laughs> the Australian went on his way as so though this were nothing. And I turned to Jaya, trying to apologize, but she was having none of that. I, I've learned not to listen, she said, waving it off. This place doesn't treat us too well, and, and I think it rubs off on these men who come to visit. <coughs> what men, I wondered. What visits? Was I one of those men? Oh, come on, but she's really pretty. Does that, does that make me... This is, this is getting weird. Andrew, say something. Well, well... I finally said, if it makes you feel better, I don't have some weird thing for Indian girls, but, but I'm not going to lie, the British thing is really hot. <laughs> she 
giggled at that, leaned in and kissed me with almost furious purpose. And those three young Indian boys finally walked off in disgust. On the last day of her assignment, we stood along the western edge of the city, watching the boats sailing out of the harbor towards the Arabian Sea. We had talked a lot those days about travel and life goals and families and friends, those things that with time build the bridge from first date small talk to latter stage big talk. But the more we talked about all of those things, about the Premier League and about the World Series that my beloved White Sox had just won, or, or whether or not New Order was in fact a better band than Joy Division, I said yes, I said no. And, and yes, we talked about my terrible apartment in Wicker Park. The more I noticed what we didn't talk about. Home. As in what was going to happen when we each had to return to each of ours. Our time was running out, but the longer we avoided the issue, the more I understood why we danced around it. Neither of us knew. Here, she said, smiling brightly as she handed me the camera. Show me how much I've taught you. I put my eye to the viewfinder and aimed out into the sea, following a pair of sailboats out of the harbor and thinking about this delicate moment we were stumbling towards, she and I with the whole world before us, forced to decide whether to drop anchor or, or whether to sail where the winds took us. I handed the camera back to her and braced myself for what came next. So what happens after tonight, I asked. I mean, when you leave, what do we do? She lowered her head for a moment and, taking a deep breath, said, I like you very much, Andrew. Her voice quivering a little now. I, I know we just met, but I like us. She rested her hands in mine as the late afternoon sun beat down on us, finally raising her eyes to meet mine. So come back to England with me. What? Come back to England with me, she said. You told me you're bored with Chicago and ready for a new life, so come with me. Be with me. And you know, I could do it. I could imagine it. She and I, the hottest item on London's social map, my words flourishing under the tender care of my new muse and her photography opening my eyes to fantastic worlds I couldn't even dream of. She and I around town, a sea of onlookers parting before us, flashbulbs burning ahead of miles upon miles of words written about us, all the important gallery openings, all the most exclusive clubs, the finest of high-end restaurants, and the best of the low-rent pubs. There we'd be, the art world's newest and hottest power couple, rising literary star Andrew Riley and world-famous photographer Jaya. <clears throat> was her last name. <laughs> anyway. And come to think of it, what else didn't I know about this woman? And what, really, did she know about me? Did I really want to move to England to live with a girl I had just met last week on vacation? <laughs> Who do we think we were? I wanted to say something beautiful, something poetic and wondrous that wouldn't let her down, something that didn't sound like an excuse that would show her how badly I wanted to hold on to her, but all that came out was, I can't. She smiled and put her hand on my cheek as those pretty green eyes began to well up. I understand, she said. You have to go. We both do. And what killed me was not the sun slowly fading into the water or the boats setting sail to shores unknown or the knowledge that I was witnessing, witnessing an ending in slow motion. But what killed me was just the simple way she had stressed both. Just enough to guide, but not enough to hold. We pulled each other close, her lips pressed softly to mine for what must have been hours, days, 
forever until I stepped back, understanding this was only going to become more difficult the longer we held on. I turned away from her, slowly, finally forging my way back into the crowded street to start the long walk to my hotel, stopping briefly, briefly to look back towards where I had left her, thinking maybe I could form some final, perfect memory before she vanished forever, but by then she had already ducked behind her camera, already back to work. So I waved goodbye to nothing in particular and walked on. I returned home later that month into the gaping mall of another awful Chicago winter, right back to my terrible apartment in Wicker Park, but vowing to stick to the plan as best I could, quit my job, go to graduate school, start building that portfolio, become that glamorous writer. It should go without saying that some parts of this plan came a little easier than others. <laughs> Still, more often than I wanted to admit, I would catch myself thinking of that afternoon by the harbor, wondering if I had been a coward for letting her go. Other times, something would trigger the thought for me. A girl passing by on the street with even the faintest resemblance. A tourist in his camera trying to take home a small piece of Chicago. Or something in the news just briefly mentioning England. I should have gone with her, I would tell myself. Then, no, I shouldn't have. Then, yes, I should have. Then, forget it, she's gone. Then, and whose fault is that, anyway? There were ideas I would keep coming back to, ideas I just assumed had no real resolution and never would, until one afternoon that spring, when I returned home to find a heavily padded package in the mailbox with no return address, but numerous international postmarks inside of which I found a CD and a short letter. Dear Andrew, I thought you might like having these. I know I do. Best wishes, Shia. Sitting down at my desk and placing the disc into my computer, I watched the images fill my screen, alternately gorgeous and terrible, subjects vaguely familiar, and after a moment, I suddenly realized what I was looking at. Jaya, that first afternoon in the marketplace, her long black hair dancing in the dusty Indian breeze, or the old man selling silver bracelets in the plaza, or the boats heading into the sunset, they were all the pictures we had taken. Together. But after all the scenery and stills came six black and white shots I'd never seen, but which so perfectly explained everything about us and our brief time together better than any scribbled words of mine ever could. And in the first three, a lone male walks down a busy street, away from the photographer and increasingly obscured by the commotion around him. He moves further into the crowd, pale skin and buzz cut, the only things setting him apart from the ocean of people surrounding him. In the fourth, the camera zooms in as he looks over his shoulder and waves to an unseen person out of frame. In the fifth, the subject lowers his head and wipes his eyes. And in the sixth and final frame, the young man disappears completely and the crowd bustles on without him. And I leaned back in my chair, took a deep breath and just felt the weight of the image in front of me because here, now, all these days and weeks and months after she and I had parted, alone in a room she would never know, the two of us half a world apart, staring into this picture that so neatly contained nothing, yet somehow captured everything, I finally, finally understood what she had been trying to show me all along. Because even if I wasn't there, she could see me. And I knew that I, if I looked closely enough, I could see her too. <laughs>